I worked at a laundromat. That's already scary enough in itself. We do the laundry service here and you don't want to know the stuff I've seen. The stuff customers have the audacity to bring in here when the only solution would be to burn what they bring in. More often than you'd think, we have to tell people to come back to pick up their dirty laundry because we just can't wash it. Or we won't. They always come and end up washing the stuff in our washers anyway, but hey, if I don't have to touch the stuff, whatever. Now the story I'm about to tell you is one that still confuses me to this day. It was Halloween 2007. We were supposed to close early, but my boss ended up telling me to stay late because he thought being the only laundromat open on Halloween night sounded like a good business opportunity. I don't think he would have thought that if he was the one that had to stay there though. So instead of closing at 6pm, we were going to close at 11pm. I was promised double overtime so I was all for it. My boss left around 7, gave me the keys and told me to lock up before I left. I really thought it would be a super slow night, but it wasn't. A lot of older folks came in to do their laundry. They said they were grateful for the late hours on Halloween since it meant that there would be fewer kids in the store than usual. By 10pm everyone was gone and I didn't expect anyone else to come in that night. About 20 minutes before closing a man came in. He was wearing torn up dirty clothes and reeked of alcohol and I think weed. I tried not to judge though and told him that he wouldn't have time to dry his stuff before we closed, but he was still welcome to use the washer if he didn't mind taking his wet clothes with him. I would have stayed longer for him to dry his clothes, but I promised my husband that I'd be home early enough to help put the kids to bed and Eleven was already pushing it. I didn't really know what to think when he pulled out blood-soaked clothing from the black trash bag he was carrying. And when I say blood-soaked, I don't mean dried blood. I mean, when this guy pulled the clothes out of the bag, they were sopping wet and dripping with blood. I was staring at him wide-eyed. He must have noticed because he turned to me and asked if we had any bleach and that he was a butcher and those were his work clothes. He bought some bleach and all I could say back to him was, mm-hmm. His clothes smacked against the sides of the washer as he loaded them in and I watched the water and soap turn dark red as the machine swirled the clothes around. When the buzzer finally went off, signaling the cycle was over, I was relieved. He'd chosen the quick cycle, so it was only around 10 past when he was done and I was excited to go home. But when he pulled the clothes out, they weren't even close to being clean. He came up to the counter and asked, well, actually begged, to please let him run them again. That meant another 30 minutes of me being there with this really sketchy guy washing gallons of blood out of his clothes, but I felt like I couldn't say no. I didn't buy the butcher's story and asked him again what all the blood was from and this time actually got a different story. He said that he wasn't actually a butcher and just used that as an excuse. He said it was actually fake blood that he bought from the Halloween store for a prank that he was playing on his buddies that night. He slipped and got it all over himself instead. I didn't buy that either, but I didn't want him to know that so I agreed to let him run them through again. He restarted the washer after adding more bleach and the water ran clear this time. He asked if I wanted to hear a scary story and God knows I didn't, but again, thought saying no to this man wasn't an option so I just said sure. And here's what he said. A man was walking in an alleyway at night when he got this urge an urge he'd been feeling on and off for years. He always held back and learned to ignore it, but this time, he couldn't. He wouldn't. He had to give in. He had to satisfy this craving he'd been having. It felt like if he didn't, he would die. His soul would die. What was this urge? It was the urge to kill. The man had experimented with death since childhood. He would dissect dead animals he found and became weirdly fascinated by serial killers in the way they thought. He related to them, he even wanted to be like them sometimes, well, the pre-prison version of them at least. Killing animals was fine but it was never enough. When he got into his later adult years and got a job, moving up a level was all he ever thought about. He found himself in that alleyway, fully prepared to go up to that level, he just didn't know exactly how. He didn't have a plan or know where to go, who to look for, he just knew that was the night. He walked through downtown and saw a woman standing on the corner. She was obviously a call girl, and he asked her if he could buy her services and if they could go step into an alley since he had nowhere else to take her. She agreed and they walked together into the darkness. 
As he walked behind her, he saw an old rusty metal pipe laying on the ground beside a dumpster. He picked it up and hit her in the back of the head with it. He hit her so hard she fell to the ground completely unconscious. Her head began oozing blood, and he'd never seen so much blood come out of the human body before and he was entranced by it. He sat down next to her and put his hands in the blood, rubbing it all over his face and clothes. He picked her up and laid her head into his lap and watched the blood drain over his body. The feeling he got was like no other. It was like something he couldn't even describe. I told him to stop telling me the story since it was grossing me out and really scaring me and thankfully he did. Before I knew it, the buzzer to the machine went off again and he was loading his pink wet clothes into his bag and heading out the door. I was a little scared to leave after him but I just wanted to get home. I grabbed my things, locked up and rushed quickly to my car in the night. The next day when I went to open the laundromat in the morning, there were officers waiting for me and I instantly knew why. There could be no other explanation. When they asked me if a man came in with bloody clothes the night before and I told them everything. I asked how they knew he came in and they said that they were able to follow him on security cameras and street cams and saw him come into the laundromat from the camera across the street. It turns out the story he told me was true, and it was of course about him. Thankfully, the woman he had obviously tried to murder narrowly survived after someone found her lying there not long after she was hit. She lost a lot of blood from her skull area and was on life support, but was expected to recover in time. They still haven't found the guy, terrifyingly enough, and thank God I haven't seen him since. There have been no other instances similar to that, so I don't know if he's attempted anything again. I keep a lookout in the news and pray he never tries to hurt anyone again even though with what he said, I know he probably will. I'm scared for anyone who has to face that evil man. I don't know what I would do if I saw him again, but I do know one thing. I'll never, ever work late on Halloween night at a laundromat, ever again. I want to start off by saying I'm not one of those people that thinks kids shouldn't have candy on Halloween. Growing up, I even hated the people who would hand out apples and pretzels. It was always such a bummer. But one year, I was working so much that I forgot to get candy until literally the day of, and when I went to the store to get some, there wasn't any left. The only thing left was some stupid pretzels and the ghost spider in web shapes. I mentally screamed at myself, but I had no other choice to get those and hand them out tonight when kids would eventually be coming by. Throughout the whole night, every time I handed out the pretzels, I apologized to the kids and told them next year I'd have full-size candy bars. No one seemed to be upset by the pretzels, and some kids even told me that they were happy to get pretzels, but I think they were just saying that to be nice. It was all fine and dandy until around 10pm. I opened the door to a group of teenage boys who were not at all pleased with what I had to give them. I was surprised that they actually had the audacity to complain and call me a fat loser for giving them pretzels instead of candy. One of them even demanded I give them money for ruining their Halloween and not having the good stuff. After around the fifth insult, I just shut my door. I heard one of them kick it as they were leaving and one of them shouted, you'll regret this. They were just stupid kids though. I didn't think they'd actually do anything to me just because one of the many houses they went to gave them pretzels. I turned my porch lights off to signal that I was done handing out stuff for the night and went and sat on the sofa to watch scary movies and eat some popcorn as the night rolled on. A couple of hours later as I was watching the original Halloween movie, I heard a crashing sound coming from the front door. I went to see what it was and I found a rock with a note tied to it that said, do you regret it now? Believe it or not I actually chuckled a little because it was so cheesy and set the rock and note down on the kitchen counter as I went to get a tarp to cover the window so no rain could get in, as we were expecting a small storm the next day. Obviously, I was livid. When I came back into the room with the tarp, I heard another crashing sound coming from the bedroom on the other side of the house. Again, there was a rock with another note that said, You fat pig, we'll kill you. This time, I felt my stomach sink, and there was no chuckle. This isn't fun anymore. 
I picked up my phone and called the police who told me that they were really busy that night and it might be a little while until someone could come out there. She told me to call back if the situation escalated, but if no one was actually harming me, they couldn't make what was happening to me a priority over anyone else who was calling them that night. They were very low staffed. So, I put tarps on both the windows and sat back down to just try and enjoy the rest of the movie, I guess, but I just couldn't. The whole time I was thinking about what the note said and the fact that I was just a sitting duck with my windows broken in like that. I heard my car alarm go off next, but I wasn't about to open the door to go outside and see what was going on. Instead, I headed upstairs and looked out my bedroom window. The windshield had been completely smashed in and the rest of the car didn't look much better. All I could think about was how these kids must be certifiably insane to do this over some stupid pretzels. All at once, bricks and stones came crashing through every window in my house. One narrowly missed my head as it passed through the window that I was looking out of. Glass was flying in every direction, and I was screaming as the sound of every window breaking was almost too much to bear. I had started to become scared for my life, so I grabbed the phone and called the police again to tell them that they needed to get there immediately. I saw the neighbors come outside to see what the noise was, and I yelled for them to call the police and get back inside. I rushed downstairs to get out of the house and take refuge with one of the neighbors, but that was never going to happen. At the bottom of the stairs was the same group of kids from earlier, the same kids who had been terrorizing me that night. Only this time, they were holding bats and rope. I rushed back into my bedroom and locked the door behind me, but that didn't stop them. They broke through the door like it was nothing and rushed towards me, screaming like they were going into battle or something. They beat me while screaming insults and laughing. I remember laying there and becoming numb to every blow that came across my body, and the laughing is what disturbed me the most. They were enjoying what they were doing, and eventually, all I saw was black. The police arrived some time later to find me curled up in the fetal position on my bedroom floor, bruised and bloodied. They called an ambulance that took me to the hospital, and I ended the night with eight broken ribs, a broken collarbone, torn ligaments, multiple lacerations to my body, a fractured eye socket and fractured skull. They told me with the beating I got I was lucky to have survived with no internal injuries or major brain damage. I spent a couple of months in the hospital and had to move in with my mother during my recovery. Thankfully, those idiots were stupid enough to brag about what they did in school. They must have bragged to the wrong person because one of the people they told ended up going to the police with the information. All in all, eight boys between the age ranges of 14 to 17 were arrested and charged with home invasion and attempted murder, as well as assault with a deadly weapon. They were all tried as adults and their sentences ranged from 12 to 25 years. Some made deals to talk about what had happened to get lighter sentences, and I was relieved that they got the time they did. I had little hope when they were originally arrested since they were all minors. I have fully recovered and the only lasting injury I have has been PTSD from that night. All in all, I'm just glad I'm alive today, able to tell the story. Safe to say, I don't hand out pretzels anymore. I don't hand out anything. I refuse to answer my door on Halloween night and I don't want to risk angering the wrong kids and possibly repeat the scariest night of my entire life. Hey everyone, this is a story that I remember recently while talking to my friends about stuff we used to do in high school. For clarification, I'm a female, and the story happened around 2015 to 2016. I also went to school in a small southern town where news spreads very fast. When the story happened, my friends and I were juniors in high school. We were kind of the nerdy outcasts in my school and we tended to play get-togethers all around the holidays. Usually, we would just play video games, order pizza, you know, all that good stuff. We were planning our usual Halloween get-together for the year, when gossiping was spreading around about a huge Halloween party that was taking place just outside of our town. My friends and I weren't interested, but a lot of girls at our school were. 
Guys from other high schools were inviting them and a lot of other teenage girls to the party. Me and a couple of my friends were invited too, but like I said, we just weren't interested. The party was said to have tons of weed and alcohol at it, and my friends and I were pretty clean and sober. Though because of how small, boring, and religious our town was, a lot of teens were willing to get involved in some trouble, especially if it involves drugs and alcohol. After Halloween, we had police at our school asking questions to specific students and even interrupting our classes to talk to people. Well, as it turns out, it wasn't a harmless Halloween party hosted by some teenage boys. It was actually a Halloween party hosted by creepy old men who had paid teenage boys to lure teenage girls to their house. They were found out because some girls tried to leave the party and were then stopped by one of the men. Our girl had brought her boyfriend, and he stepped in to try and help her. One of the men got so furious by this, that he ended up beating the shit out of the boyfriend to the point of unconsciousness. A neighbor close by where the party was called the police, and the men were then arrested swiftly. When the police searched the house, there were drugs, guns, and voicemails talking about kidnapping and selling some of the girls at the party. They even found text messages where they were taking pictures of the girls at the party, for the approval of whoever they were talking to. The arrests and evidence spread like wildfire in our town. All of the people, especially parents, were terrified. I remember that some of the kids at our school had even moved away after that incident. I graduated college pretty recently, and the story came up again at another Halloween get-together with my friends. It's still terrifying to think what might have happened if the police weren't called. What horrible things would have happened to our classmates if nobody witnessed anything? We all agree that it was sheer luck that everybody made it out okay and that the boyfriend who stepped in recovered at the hospital. Just remember to be careful out there. You really never know what can happen. This took place when I was about 19 years old. And this is something that nobody should ever have to go through. To cut to the chase, it was Halloween night of 2010, and my friends and I had been invited to a Halloween party from a few classmates that was open to pretty much anyone. Kind of like what you'd expect at a block party. I was not the most popular girl in school, so I really didn't know anyone except for the friend I was going with. There were lights, food, music, and they even had a pole in the back, which was off limits for whatever reason. My friend was busy getting wasted with a few guys, and I was that awkward third wheel girl who didn't know what to do. Eventually, I grabbed a couple of beers and went outside to go smoke by some trees, since smoking obviously wasn't allowed inside. So, I'm smoking a cigarette and practically chugging my beers by a tree, enjoying that cool October breeze when I look to my left and see some guy walking towards me. I give him a quick wave to say hello and he nervously says hi. At first, I thought he was from the party, but the more I noticed him, the more I began to realize that he didn't look like he belonged here. Most of us were high school aged. This guy looked like he was in his mid-forties or fifties. His eyes were red and his face was pale, and he wore a dirty white undershirt with cargo pants. He walked right up to me and said, Got any more smokes? I could use one. I reply with, <laughs> Sure thing. I give him my lighter and he takes a few puffs and immediately throws it onto the ground and stomps on it. It was a bit unexpected, but I didn't feel threatened. I tell him it was nice meeting him and that I was going back inside to meet my friend. All of a sudden, he tells me to wait and that he wanted to show me something he found deeper into the trees. Now, seeing as I was extremely tipsy, I accepted and he grabs my hand and we descend into the woods. We walk for about three minutes and I could barely hear the music at this point. We then come to a stop. 
He sighs and he says that what he wanted to show me was right here. Before I could ask what it was, he grabs my arm and covers my mouth tight. I'm trying to fight to get out of his grasp, but this guy was much more bigger and stronger than I was and being drunk didn't help. I'm trying to scream, but his hand was on my mouth hard, clearly trying to suffocate me. Eventually, he lets go of my arm for a brief second and at that point I saw my chance. I turn around and kick him in the kneecap, causing him to fall to the ground screaming. I'm screaming as well, while running all the way back to the party where I saw a few people looking at me with confused looks. I begin to tell them that I was almost groped and they take me back inside to inform everybody. The host of the party calls the cops and our Halloween party turned into that of a crime scene. Needless to say, the man was never found and nothing ever happened like that after that one Halloween night. For a little bit of context, I'm a female and this happened on Halloween night of 2018 and I was working at the wildly popular Spirit Halloween store. It wasn't the best job but I was struggling financially to keep up with my college tuition and rent so I really needed the money. With us being the top Halloween store, we were obviously open on Halloween night and that was one of the nights where I didn't want to work but unfortunately had to. It was me and my co-worker Cameron. I was in charge of checking the merchandise while Cameron was our cashier and the store was dead. To cut to the chase, I had been putting a few items in their correct places due to the customers not caring and just leaving them wherever they want. As I'm walking around, I hear the door open and see a very freakishly tall man walk in. I say, Hello, welcome to Spirit. He gives me a nod to, I guess say thanks, and then walks around the store. At one point, I'm putting some of the masks in their correct places when the man comes walking in the aisle. I give him a polite smile and asks if he needed help with anything. With a very deep and raspy voice, he says, Yeah, you could help me by giving me your number. I nervously laugh, trying not to be rude and tell him that I couldn't do that and that I have a boyfriend. Oh, well, I mean, he doesn't have to know. I can give you a ride home when you get off work. I tell him no thank you and that I have a ride, but would be more than happy to help him with anything else. He gave me a firm no and then left out the door, clearly upset that it didn't go his way. When I told Cameron about the guy, he was just as creeped out as I was. Cameron, being the good friend he was, offered to take me home since he actually had a car. I gladly accepted and thanked him. Fast forward till around closing time, we clean everything up and I clock out and close the store. While walking to his car, I saw the man in an old Honda Civic staring right at me with a look I can't even seem to forget about. It was the kind of look you'd give when you're angry about something, as if he'd be back for me. I ended up telling my boss the whole ordeal and he asked Cameron if he could drive me home for the remainder of my time working there since we only had a week left. Seeing as Spirit was a seasonal store. We had only worked for about two months. I am forever grateful that Cameron had offered me a ride that day because I had no idea of that man's intentions. I'm a 32 year old female living in Colorado and Halloween is by far my favorite time of the year. But one Halloween stands out in my mind that I'll never forget. And it's not for the right reasons. It was 2007 and I was about 17 years old. Once it got dark, I met up with a few of my friends, Brittany, Rick, Curtis, and Micah. 
We were walking around a trailer park, smoking weed, and taking shots, and just having a good time. We must have been walking for about 20 minutes when we came up on this group of guys that were smoking a meth pipe just out in the open. We just walked straight past them when one of them yelled, hey, as loud as possible. We all stopped and turned around and Curtis said, yeah. One of the guys asked in a demanding voice, want to give me a hit of what you got there? Curtis held up the roach. We just finished smoking and he said, sorry man, we just finished it off. They didn't reply. They just turned away from us. Suddenly, one of them turned around and asked for five dollars. Again, Curtis responded, Sorry, man, I'm broke. The guy gave a really weird smile, baring his crooked yellow teeth. But his eyes were dead and cold. It was very unsettling and clearly a forced smile. He then said, Oh, all right. You guys have a good night. We turned back and started walking away. Something was off about that group of people. But then again, they were on hard drugs. We walked for about a minute until I heard a bunch of people running up behind us. It was Halloween at that time, so there was a lot of people everywhere. But it was that group of people again, and they were coming up fast. We bolted down the road, and everyone ran off in different directions. I jumped a few fences and hid inside a random person's shed. My heart was beating so hard I thought it was about to explode. I waited about 20 minutes, slowly opened the shed, and peered out. I didn't see anyone, so I started to look for my friends. Found Brittany and Rick. We looked around for Curtis and Micah. Curtis' phone was dead, and Micah wasn't answering. We finally found Curtis. One of those psychos stabbed him in the leg and took his wallet, and his jeans were soaked in blood. We called 911 right away. Then we found Micah laying on the sidewalk. She could barely get up, and she told us that two of the guys jumped her and beat her, as well as stealing her money from her pocket. For reference, Micah is about 115 pounds and 5 foot 1. It disgusts me to think that full-grown men were so high that they thought it was okay to beat up an innocent small girl like that. It definitely ruined one of my favorite holidays, and I still think about it these years later. If a random group of people ever call out to you, just keep walking. I always carry a taser, pepper spray, just any weapon. You never know what kind of weirdos are lurking out there in the dark. I'm a girl and this happened when I was about nine years old. At the time, I loved to trick or treat in my neighborhood. This was short lived because by then, my neighborhood wasn't exactly safe anymore. That year, which was 1992, I attended a church Halloween party. There were many kids that I recognized from school and from nearby areas. I dressed up in a little devil costume that year, complete with paste on horns and, you know, the usual. Yeah, a little bold for a church party, but several other kids were dressed as devils and I saw many girls dressed as witches. The party host, who I'll call Father Francis, stood greeting everyone. I remember he was dressed like a version of Captain Hook. Every kid attending got goodie bags at the door from Father Francis. For some reason, every kid who was dressed up as a witch or a devil got a baggie of homemade cookies. They looked like sugar cookies with powdered sugar dusting the tops. The party was great fun, but I was eager to get home and try a cookie. Father Francis had told us not to eat the cookies there because he said it's our little secret. I saw nothing sinister at the time, but looking back, something seemed weird and wrong. When I got home, I decided to try one the next day. I remember finally trying a cookie. I almost immediately sped it out in the garbage. It tasted really bad, and the powdered sugar was bitter tasting. My mom noticed my reaction and asked to try one. Her reaction was identical to mine. She demanded to know where I've gotten these from. I told her Father Francis had given me a bag of them. Grabbing the bag, she inspected the cookies. She smelled the bag, making a suspicious face. And then she tasted the powdered sugar. Her eyes widened, and she practically hurled the bag of cookies into the trash. Don't eat those, honey, alright? Those are bad. 
very bad cookies. As this was a Saturday, we had no way of learning fellow classmates or friends. Monday, I learned the worst had happened. 16 children, all who had been given a bag of cookies, had been hospitalized for contamination. We learned the powdered sugar was in fact ant chalk. Of the 16 children that got sick, two died because they eaten a whole bag of cookies. Thankfully, I never got sick because I only bitten one, but never swallowed it. Father Francis ended up going to prison for 20 years for his involvement. He claimed in his defense, he was doing God's work by ridding the world of evil. He turned out to be an evil man who felt no pity for the children who got sick, or the two who had sadly died. I heard as they hauled him off to prison, he kept screaming, I did God's work. I'm a tool of God. I did nothing wrong. I did nothing wrong. From then on, I never attended another church party of any kind, and my trust for those figures was pretty much destroyed. I also have almost never accepted baked goods from others again. I kept thinking, what if I had been one of those who had eaten a full bag? Chances are, I've been hospitalized too, or much worse. The more the story is, be careful of anything you accept from others, even if they're a person of cloth.